Welcome to the Moved to Meditate podcast. I'm your host, Addie DeHilster. This is a place for vibrant discussions about mindfulness, movement practices, and ways to find more balance and presence in daily life. Here, you'll find resources to help you progress on your path, as well as insightful conversations with mindful movement, yoga, meditation, and Dharma teachers from a range of traditions. On this podcast, we spotlight embodied approaches to mindfulness and the more contemplative aspects of movement practice. Listen in and connect to a community of like-minded practitioners. Hello, everyone. We have such a fun podcast today. This is a conversation with my friend and colleague, Jessica Patching Bunch, about nature, being outside, the body-brain benefits of green exercise, and what that has to do with mindfulness. It's almost spring, almost, (laughs) and for a lot of us here in the U.S., it has been a real winter, like real. This one was no joke for a lot of us. And I know I'm personally looking forward to some warmer days and more sun, and I thought it would be a great time to dream about that and learn a little more about green exercise. The benefits of moving in nature are many, and there are some really interesting overlaps with mindfulness practice. So hopefully this episode will inspire you to set an intention for more movement in nature in the upcoming seasons. If you enjoy this episode or you've learned something from other conversations here, may I ask you to please take a moment to rate and review the podcast. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, you go to our show's page on the app and scroll down to where it says ratings and reviews, find the write a review button and share a little something. Not only is the feedback super helpful to me when I'm planning future episodes, but it makes a huge difference in new people finding the show and enjoying these conversations too. Here's one of the sweet reviews we've received about the podcast. This one is from Edelweiss133. Addie carefully selects guests who come from a variety of backgrounds and traditions. Many of the episodes include interesting theories and practices that are evidence-based Yet, the science is approachable and accessible to newbies and advanced practitioners alike. When listening to Addie and her guests, I always learn a little nugget or two that inspires my wellness journey. Thank you so much to the person who left that comment. That is amazing to hear, and I really, really appreciate the support. Okay, everyone, thank you so much for being here today. I hope you will really enjoy this episode with Jessica Patching Bunch. Welcome back, everybody. So today I have with me Jessica Patching Bunch, or JPB, as I know her. (laughs) And she's a stress resilience coach who's on a mission to change how we understand and approach mental health. And I love talking to JPB because she has such a solid science background. She spent a lot of time in the field of neurodevelopmental research And then she started a business called Brain Body Resilience, which is all about bringing that kind of science knowledge to regular people. And she's super good at giving the science knowledge to us in a way that we can actually understand and utilize. So I really appreciate that. And she's actually the first repeat guest that I've had on the podcast. So welcome back, JPB. Oh, that's so exciting. I didn't know that. I'm honored to be here again. Thank you so much. (laughs) My pleasure. Do you want to say a little bit more about who you are or update our listeners on what you've been doing with BBR since we talked to you before? Yeah. um, I don't remember what we said last time at all. Um, (laughs) I think it was like stress resilience (laughs) basics and like what is stress? Yeah. Well, and that is still, I think, um, so needed. So like you said, I I worked in neurodevelopmental research. I had plans on being a researcher. I went through school and I thought, oh my gosh, this is, this is it. I want to research. And then I, you know, worked in research and I was like, oh wait, this is, (laughs) this is not what I want to be doing with my days. But there's so much useful information that people don't know because they don't have access to it or 
it's not accessible in the way that it is understandable by people who don't have a foundational understanding of science. Um, and a lot of the time the way it's presented is super boring and dry and it's just like, okay, I don't <laughs> there's wanna, that. you just zone out. And it's like, I don't care. Um, <laughs> but there's so much useful information just about how we work as humans that we don't get in, you know, kindergarten, elementary school, where I think we should be learning those things along with writing mm -hmm. and math, like how to navigate yourself. Um, and so those, those basics of what stress are and how it affects you and how your brain and body work together are still, still what I'm working with. And, um, it just is amazing when we have those foundations of understanding that we can participate in our own well-being, how much we can change the experience we have in our days. That's so empowering. And that's, I think, you know, I was talking to someone yesterday and we, we were talking about the idea that the kind of hierarchy that we have in our medical system, how for so long, <clears throat> excuse me, the idea was that you go to the doctor, they tell you, this is what's wrong with you. Here's what you do about it with the prescription. And then you're like, okay, I will follow these instructions. Taking away any kind of personal responsibility or autonomy. And mm. doctors have a specialized education. They do not know your body, your experience. Um, and so I think just understanding that we have so much more power over and and ability to affect change in ourselves in our body in our health and well-being than maybe we've been led to believe mm -hmm. um that is yes empowering and and then we have to take action you know on that so. <laughs> <laughs> i love that yeah it's not enough to just know we have to actually implement some of that knowledge or you know develop practices for ourselves to support our best, you know, health and thriving. Yes. Yeah. And I love that word practice. And I remember, and I think I might've said this last time, but I remember it was like the, you know, I first started taking yoga classes and they would talk about, this is your practice. And I just, I was like, <laughs> what, does just like what does that mean? <laughs> I just was like, this sounds so stupid. And I don't understand what that means. And it's because everything's a practice <laughs> because we have to practice. Mm -hmm. It is not just like, oh, I am did this once and I'm good at it. It is a lifelong practice of trial and error of learning how to learn ourselves and care for ourselves. Yeah, I, that's hilarious because it's it can sound so hoity-toity like this yeah, is your practice. Exactly. And, <laughs> <laughs> but it's so true. And I, I saw... Um, somebody reminded me recently of like every moment we're practicing something we're developing some habit through the actions and choices we're making in every single moment. So yes. when we say this is your practice, it's like, this is your chance to be deliberate about yes. what you're, how you're conditioning yourself and what you're practicing. I love that because, you know, I always tell people your, your stress response is a biologically adaptive response to, for survival. It's mm -hmm. helping you to understand what is threatening and what you need to do about it so that we can survive. And so what we do in those moments, your body is going to automatically do more of later on because you are always teaching your brain and body what to do with the experience that you're having with what you are practicing in that moment, you're building patterns. Mm -hmm. And I love that because it is, you know, you are practicing something whether it's yeah. what you want to be practicing or not, or if you realize you're practicing something or not, those are different, but you are always practicing something, building yeah. some kind of pattern. Exactly. Yeah, that's brilliant. I love that. And yeah. And so I, I just love how your work is really all about that, you know, making people aware of the different ways they could be you know, approaching their day or the way they think about things or different, you know, practices they can put into uh, their, their, you know, their time here on earth to make things a little bit smoother or to relate to things a little bit better. 
And one of the things that really caught my attention that I saw you talking about some time ago on the Instagram was green exercise. So that's what I really wanted to talk to you about today is this idea of green exercise, which I found super intriguing. I'm someone who loves being outside and I always have this like really intuitive sense that it's very good for me. Like sometimes I call it going out to get my vitamin tree. I love that. (laughs) (laughs) So it really literally feels like I'm taking in some kind of nature nutrient or something. And it turns out that there is some research to back that and that it really is good for us. So can you tell us just to start with, like, what is green exercise? So green exercise is just exercise done in natural environments. Hmm. So walking, running, skipping, dancing, body weight conditioning, team sports. Um, Sometimes, you know, you have yoga in the park or Tai Chi or um, Qigong, uh, things like swimming, surfing, paddle boarding, Mm. however you want to move your body outside in nature. And I think it is, where do I want to go first? There's, (laughs) there's so much to say. I, the exercising outside is just increasing the benefits of exercise for Mm. your, you know, mental and physical health because the green exercise part, the being in nature part has similar effects as meditation. This is what studies have shown us. Um, It's one of the most effective ways to increase attention and focus, mindfulness, and then decrease stress and anxiety, uh, symptoms of depression, fear, anger. And the way that it does this is nature draws our attention outward, right? It gives us appreciation Mm. for the world around us. And when we're in nature, we don't have all of the distractions of the unnatural world that we've built around us, right? We don't have the traffic and the smog and the lights and the constant buzzing and sounds and all the things that are unnatural, that are constant stimulation and stress Mm. to our sensory systems. And so by taking that away and then adding the natural environment, things, the sound of water, the smell of the forest, um, these are natural de-stressors. And part of that is because of something called fractals, which are just a certain type of geometric form. Fractals. Fractals. This sounds like <laughs> so science fiction now. I know, right? <laughs> what are Fractals. <laughs> So they're just a specific type of geometric shape that is found mostly in nature. Um, And the way that our eyes respond to it is significant. We found um, using both fMRI and EEG um, studies, we found that the physiological stress from looking at fractals reduces by up to 60%. What? That is significant. Wow. And there are suggestions that fractals activate certain areas of the brain that are responsible for regulating stress. Um, How it does that? Can you give me an an example of like, when am I seeing fractals outside? Um, What does a fractal look like? Trees, (laughs) um, rocks. It is just embedded in the um, the shapes of nature. Wow. Um, so something, is it a visible pattern or something that we're picking up on subconsciously? It is, it is a visible pattern, but I don't know how, I'm not actually sure how to explain, uh, recognizing that, um, the spirals and shells, the shapes of Mm. leaves, um, the bark on trees, the kind of, uh, jagged edges around that, that, uh, the way that that stimulates our eyes is different than other looking at my computer geometric screen. patterns. Yes. <laughs> looking at my phone. <laughs> yes. So if we look at like, I'm looking at wow. my, my desk right now and my computer is, you know, a square kind of shape. All the keys on it are square shapes. My microphone is a, a has a round kind of pop filter and 
I have a mirror here. It's square. All of so there are definite edges to all of these things in in the man made world, right? They're round. They're square. They're whatever other kinds of shapes, even if it's you know an octagon with multiple sides, or uh-huh. there's still definite sides. Whereas in nature, the limits of that shape, the the sides of it, the structure of it, isn't as definite, right? Because it's like a growth pattern. It, it's yes. not manufactured. It's like, exactly, exactly. Yeah. That. Yes. Okay. And I am not completely clear about how, you know, or why the brain, but it, we are nature and we recognize yeah. nature. And so because of that recognition of the natural, our our frontal lobe, our, our kind of higher level executive functioning part of our brain produces those feel good uh, alpha brain waves, which are the, the type of brain wave that induces feelings of calm and increases activity um, to enhance our ability to absorb new information and creativity. And another thing that does that is meditation and practicing wow. mindfulness. And so we can see because there are, you know, ample, there's ample research on, on meditation and mindfulness and how that, <clears throat> excuse me, we were talking before we press record. Like <laughs> as soon as, as soon as we record, there's something in my throat. I'm the same way this morning. <laughs> um, but so, so we know that, that meditation and mindfulness increase um, connectivity between our right and left hemispheres of our brain. We know that it helps to decrease the activation of our kind of fear response area and, um, and so many other benefits, increase memory and attention and focus. So we know that. And then having the understanding that being in nature gives us, just automatically gives us mm-hmm. those same kind of benefits. That's now, so amazing. And this, this whole piece about the fractals is kind of mind blowing. And I, actually, it's it's making sense to me because last weekend I went on a forest bathing walk with a guided forest bathing experience in Portland with um, Forest Bathing PDX, and I saw that. The, it was so fun. And the man who leads these, he's an arborist and he knows everything about oh, trees. That's cool. And he's also a yoga teacher, so he leads you in some mindful movement, and then this this kind of mellow stroll through a park and he points out all kinds of interesting things about trees and lichens and leaf patterns and things and it was such fun and but one of the things he talked about was like he picked up a pine cone and he was like humans relax when we see these kinds of patterns in nature exactly and i was like that's fractals. cool <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. that's a fractal okay yes. i didn't get it and now now it makes sense yeah it's, yeah you know it's And there is, uh, I read an article that was kind of, um, it was uh, a meta-analysis, so it was just reviewing the current literature on green exercise. And um, their conclusion was there isn't sufficient literature to support, uh, conclusively support that this is beneficial, even though they were reviewing articles that said it was beneficial. He's just saying more research is warranted here or well, something I think like that. <laughs> science is so limited in the way that it chooses to approach what is viable, right? Because unless mm-hmm. it's quantifiable, mm-hmm. then they're like, well, there isn't enough you know, to measure here. It's hard to measure things that are subjective. So that's exactly. why they look at like hormones yes. and brain waves because... So that's, just hearing me say, I feel better is not like something they want to publish in a journal. <laughs> no, but yes, this is this, exactly. So yeah. it may not be, you know, I don't know that like, yes, subjectivity is hard, but so much of our human research is done that way. And that is kind of when I was in research, I realized who's publishing, who gets funding, which topics are chosen to have funding you know it's all we are the humans studying humans right so there's a lot of bias Mm -hmm. there's a lot of ideas about what is or isn't um science right yeah so all of that the whole idea of hard science yes yes which which (laughs) has historically and continues to set aside 
ancient wisdom that, mm-hmm. that has told us for thousands of years that these things do improve our health. These things are beneficial. It's like, but you can't prove it under a microscope or whatever. It's like, okay, mm-hmm. well, um, that's where this, this idea of autonomy comes in, right? This idea of yeah. like, but how do I feel? Mm-hmm. Because I know that when I am in nature, I feel better. Yeah. And so that idea that we don't need to look outside of ourselves for proof to validate how we're feeling Mm -hmm. and the fact that it makes us feel better. Yeah. I think that's such a huge thing. Um, It is hard to understand why, but I am totally with you that like I would go out in nature even without there being a body of scientific literature to say it's good for me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, you know, if you think about it, it's, it's hard to be mad in, in nature. Yeah. And I think I've about, <laughs> I, was, I was thinking about when I was but like, it preparing this, this uh, for this morning, I was thinking about, um, I used to get really angry going hiking with my husband um, because I had, and it all came from an incredible amount of self-judgment and self-criticism when it was a hard hike. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to, to be struggling. I didn't want it to be hard. I didn't want to see him or for him to see me struggling so hard because I felt like I shouldn't be. And so all of this, like this internal narrative about what I should be doing or that, you know, mm-hmm. resisting what actually exists, which is so, where so much of our stress comes from. Um, and I realize that now that I've done a lot of work in that area, I don't have that, uh, in nature. So it is possible and nature isn't going to take away <laughs> our kind of internal narrative. That's a, that's a different body of work, but, um, but yes, uh, just being in nature and then, and then moving your body in nature, mm-hmm. um, added benefits there. I love that. And, you know, and you, you mentioned like, yeah, anytime you're doing exercise, wherever that might be, there's going to be physical benefits. And then if you do exercise in nature, you are amplifying benefits probably to the physiology of the body, but also the psychological and and mental and emotional benefits as well. Do you, do you have, we talked a lot about the fractals. Do you have more you want to say about yes. um, this piece? Like what some of those benefits are? Yeah. So um, yes, both mental and physical. And we know that, you know, those aren't actually divided. Not separate, right. Um, but studies have shown that time in nature, um, as long as people feel safe, and that is, mm-hmm. that is a, a, a huge factor. And then that leads to discussions of like, who is, you know, who, who do we have ideas that about being in nature, belonging in nature? Uh Um, And that looks different depending on where we live. Right. But um, if there is a sense of safety while you are in nature, because that, you know, safety always comes first for our nervous system. Um, So as long as we're feeling safe, uh, nature just, is an antidote for stress because it lowers our blood pressure, lowers our heart rate. Um, and, and studies have shown that it lowers cortisol levels within minutes of being in a natural setting. Um, because it does decrease that the nervous system arousal from some of the things that we talked about from the visuals that we're getting from the sign, the sounds and smells that we're getting from nature, and also from removing the the unnatural stimulus mm-hmm. from you know being in, in an urban setting, um, which then helps enhance our immune system function, um, and then all of that helps to reduce anxiety and improve mood. So, because all of our systems work together, when we reduce the nervous system arousal all of those other things just are kind of natural benefits of that. Mm -hmm. And with that, we also see increased, increased sense of um, self because we are drawn into kind of a, that mindful state again, excuse me. And so there's more space for interception, right? Mm -hmm. And 
when we're in nature, so I'm like being in nature and then moving in nature, are, you know, give kind of different benefits, but just being in nature and we have that time to pause and just be with ourselves and see what's there. Um, and then movement in nature gives us all of those, the, the brain and health benefits, physical benefits, and the added, you know, self-esteem and self, self-assurance of the movement piece. Mm-hmm. Um, so just being in natural environments has a wide range of uh, physiological outcomes, like, you know, feelings of revitalization, uh, positive engagement with your environment, uh, reduction in, in tension and confusion and anger, mm-hmm. um, increased energy. And again, this is all when we have less arousal in our nervous system, we aren't spending our energy that way. So then we have an increased energy, uh, uh, more feeling of a positive energy. Mm -hmm. It it like frees up energy that we've been using for stress purposes. Yes, exactly. (laughs) Um, Yeah. And then the, there also have been studies that show greater evidence of of just enjoyment and satisfaction with outdoor activity Mm -hmm. um, with a a higher inclination to, to repeat those activities because it feels good. And so you want to do it again. Um, Right. Which might be helpful for, for people who dread exercising or don't enjoy going to the gym or exactly doing whatever. Yes. Um, Studies also show that moving in nature gives us a sense of like oneness and purpose and connectivity and appreciation, just a better outlook on our life in those moments. Amazing. When we're, if you think about, gosh, if you think about like being in a natural setting and looking at, I mean, some of the most beautiful things that we see are nature, right? The yeah. the mountains, the Grand Canyon, <clears throat> waterfalls, all of these things, my throat won't cooperate. So excuse my voice, <laughs> but, um, you know, we, we have this, these feelings of awe and connectivity to the world around us and, and this wanderlust. And so with that stronger connection, we then have higher levels of satisfaction. People are happier in natural environments and yet we spend something like 93% of our time indoors. Um, and that's for like Americans in the U.S. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, the, the more separated we are from nature, the more easily we succumb to disease. Um, wow. And so, you know, there's, there are just so many reasons to be part of nature. And we, as we evolve, you know, with more technology all of these things, our lives become a little bit more sedentary. Mm-hmm. Um, we've created all of the, all of this incredible innovation to make us more comfortable, to make us not have to work as hard for convenience, for ease. And so much of that is amazing, right? Right. It also takes away our need to go outside as much, to put forth effort, to be uncomfortable and create a little bit of resilience and practice Mm -hmm. dealing with stress. Which is why we have to think about a concept like green exercise to, you know, bring ourselves back to that activity that is really like how we evolved and that we really need. Yeah. We have to, we have to make it a, like more of a project now because we've removed it. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) It was just, you were outside. Even, I mean, I think about even, like when my I, grandparents who were farmers, you know, yes. or when I was, right. when I was a kid, we, uh, I grew up in kind of a, it was still very rural out here where, um, where I live and a lot of farms and fields and it was mm-hmm. like, okay, go outside and don't come back until the lights come on. <laughs> you know. And, <laughs> yeah. And so we just played outside <laughs> all day. Until you hear your mom yelling. Hey, <laughs> yeah. <time> yeah. For- <laughs> and, um, and so it just used to be, or we used to, you know, have to be outside more for travel or be outside more to just live. And Mm -hmm. now we don't 
it is not a necessity. I think about even just going for a walk, which I do most days outside, specifically to look for pretty little things around me and get my movement. Mm-hmm. Um, I have to make time and space for it. Yeah. It's not just something that is in my day, except when I'm, you know, walking to my commute for work, but just be easy for that to get shoved aside yes, for other is. things. Mm-hmm. And it's, yeah. it's kind of, it is a little bit silly when, when you think about it like that, like something that we've just removed ourselves so much from nature that we have to have this thing called green exercise and instead of just like, <laughs> just go outside and move. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't have to be that complicated, right? It, no. it can just be like being mindful as you are walking from, you know, your house to your corner store in the neighborhood or something like that. Yes. That could count. And well, and that's, and making a point to take that walk. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Rather than drive a block over. Yes. Which I'm guilty of doing, but. (laughs) Well, we are because it's more convenient. It takes less time, right? We we live Mm -hmm. in this, this place of kind of just like scarcity of time and urgency of everything else. Yeah. And so we, we just tend to do the thing, like what is going to cost the less, the least amount of energy and the least amount of time. And that's what our brain wants, right? Your brain is always looking for efficiency and saving energy for survival. Mm -hmm. So it makes sense. So then we have to be intentional about building these practices and participating in these pieces of our life. I want to come back to the um, the sort of comparison with meditation and and like how mindful movement or even just you know green exercise outdoor movement yields similar benefits and similar sort of states of attention because mm-hmm. I think that's really fascinating and 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 so many people struggle with the idea of like learning to meditate because. It sounds it sounds like this this hard thing, like where we have to clear our thoughts or, or something like that. But <laughs> we naturally can tune into similar, you know, a similar state by stepping outside and being aware of our environment. And um, some of the things I was kind of just doing, like a little internet research about this topic, they talked about how like we pay attention a little bit differently when we're outside and that there's this kind of like softer and more effortless way that we're present and we're focusing. Mm. And I don't know if you know anything about that or if that resonates just, you know, as someone who spends time outside, but that the way that we pay attention in nature. Yeah, I actually, it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, That's super interesting. I'm actually going to look more into that. Um, cause that's not I can where I try to send you yeah, like, I would what love I found. That. <laughs> um, but it, but it makes sense. So if we, if we look at forest bathing, for example, mm-hmm. which for anybody who doesn't know, it's an, originated in, in Japan. Uh, and it's just the process of, of relaxation in nature. Um, and it's known as Shinrin Yoku. I know that I did not say that right or do that any justice, but in Japanese, that means forest bathing, forest bath. Um, and it's just the, the way to, it's a method of being calm and quiet amongst the trees, just observing nature around you while paying attention to your breath. And what that does is kind of align your because we know breath is always the foundation of aligning our physiology and getting our kind of mind and body in the same place. Mm-hmm. And so when we do that in nature, I think it makes sense to me that it would be kind of a softer uh, attention because, because of the things we talked about earlier, because of what our sensory systems are taking in, the types of sounds and smells and shapes. Mm-hmm that are not, I'm just trying to think of like, even when I listen to sounds of nature and studies have shown it, even if you're not in nature, looking at pictures of like a nature scape or listening, listening to sounds have the same types of effects. Oh, wow. Yeah. Interesting. Um, which is great for, you know, not everybody has access to parks around them or natural spaces. And so that's what, um, you know, I've talked about before is 
even if you don't have access to nature in your immediate environment, you can look up a nature scape video mm -hmm. or something. Um, but it makes sense to me that it would be, it's less, less threatening. There's less, um, unnatural stimulation in for your sensory systems in those nature spaces. Again, we are of nature and we, we, we recognize that. So I think, I don't know, I don't know the, the why or the how mm -hmm. behind it, mm -hmm. um, which I would like to, and I, I appreciate that, but it, it, it just, it makes sense to me in the way that our sensory systems take in the information. It wouldn't require as much processing, right? It wouldn't yeah. expend as much energy. That makes sense. And it would be more energy giving than energy taking, I think. And so, yeah, because it's something that like we just naturally understand on this like very primal level. Yeah. And I think, think that like one thing I notice when I'm more stressed or anxious or dizzy is like my attention can get really narrow and it's yes. like, that's not necessarily bad if I'm trying to focus, but that can also become fixation or like obsessing and worrying on something. And then like yeah. when I'm able to soften and broaden that focus, ah, oh, relief, right? You know, I see a bigger picture. And I think that's part of like what going outside does, like you were sort of saying earlier, like it sort of gets us out of our head and we can, yeah, we can have that sense of connectivity. And like a lot of that is, is sort of like that softening and broadening of the focus. And well, exactly. And if, yeah. if we want to look at that piece, so when we are in a, in a high, high stress state, when our sympathetic system is active, our pupils, narrow, right? We are, we are intently focused on mm -hmm. our, our vision does literally narrow. It's because, like tunnel vision. But yes, That's why we call we, it that, right? Yes, exactly. <laughs> because we are focusing in on what is this potential threat? What is this potential danger? And when we're constantly being bombarded by all of that type of stimulation or in a chronic, in chronically elevated state, we do get a very kind of narrow focus in literally in our, our visual sensory system. Mm -hmm. Um, and so being able to soften our focus, it accesses more of that parasympathetic system, right? It helps us to mm -hmm. calm down. And so when we are in nature, we're surrounded by these beautiful things, so many of them, right? Mm -hmm. Having that narrow focus doesn't allow us to, to take in that scene. And so we do widen our visual perspective. Like there's this tree over here and there's this water over here. And there's, you know, the, I hear these birds up here. So then I'm orienting my head and looking up into the trees and, and the trees in the sky. And so there's just exactly. so much more available and then it does expand and then we become more calm and then our perspective spans expands even more um mm -hmm. and it you know continues in that way and so just the way that our, our visual sensory system interacts with the world around us and our strength stress response um again that makes so much sense to why that changes the way that we attend to things in nature and and our ability to focus in nature because it frees that's up amazing. that constriction, right? Yeah. And that's similar to what we learn in meditation, but we, maybe we just have the capacity to learn it in meditation because it's natural to us and we can touch into that in nature and it becomes familiar. And then it, you know, for those of us who have a meditation practice, it can become this like beautiful weaving together and this, this dialogue between that formal practice and we're cultivating that. And then there's just like natural experiences of it when we go outside and we recognize that like, yes. Oh, this is that more expanded state. Yes. And I don't think you, you asked that question. I don't think I, I ever really answered it. I think I trailed off somewhere. Um, but I do want to touch Which on question? that because I don't like the, 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 the meditation and how, how oh. people think it looks a certain way and, and the oh, of, yeah. um, connections between that and the mindfulness outside. Um, I do. I think, I think people that have that have this idea about what meditation should look like, like your legs are crossed and your arms are doing something and you're totally 
not having thoughts, which, you know, is not really, no, none of us. Um, and meditation, you know, I'm not a meditation teacher, but when I'm looking at like your mental focus and like the kind of process of that in meditation, it just means you're paying attention to something. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And so you're choosing to focus on something. And so when we are outside and we're, and you know, and similar with, with mindfulness, we are just paying attention to what is happening presently. And when we're outside and experiencing that awe that nature gives us, that connectedness that nature gives us, we are taking in so much and it, it is so much, it is beautiful, right? Those, those fractals, mm-hmm. they're, they're appealing to our system. Mm-hmm. And so we are in that moment. We are just looking at what is happening around us and what is happening is just being, right? Because in nature, if we're just out in the forest or we're sitting by the river, nature's not doing, right? Nature just is. And so I think that gives us permission to just be in that moment. Mm. And, and, and the way that 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 coincides with, you know, with meditation and mindfulness, it just, your focus is on what is in front of you because you're just looking at the branches and and the leaves and the patterns and looking at the different kinds of moss or or whatever you have available to you in your area. But, um, so that makes sense to me that it would be meditative, that it, Mm -hmm. it would clear, clear your mind because you are present with those things. And when you read the, the, you know, early texts from the Buddhist tradition or the yogic tradition, they all are learning to meditate outside, you know, in forests, under trees, in nature. That yeah. was, that was never like really separate from how those contemplative practices even developed. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, and if we think about it, and I don't know very much about, <clears throat> about this, but things like grounding, right? Mm-hmm. The, the, electromagnetic magnetic field that exists on the earth, right? We, when we're in nature, when we are touching the earth, we interact with that. We can't avoid it. It just is there <laughs> and, and, mm-hmm. and our body interacts with it. And, the, you know, similarly, you know, trees, flowers, bushes, whatever nature is alive. They are they're growing, they are living, they are communicating, they have, you know, energetic properties. And we also benefit from that. And some of that, those energetic properties are, you know, at a different, there's a different type of energy than the manufactured energy that we have in urban settings. Mm -hmm. And so how that affects us, because we are bioelectrical chemical beings, right? We run on electricity, the power of, you know, electric current is what Mm -hmm. runs our, our neurons, you know, communication. And so again, that just makes sense to me that all of those pieces together add to the benefit of just being in nature. And then if we are actively moving our bodies, we're getting that, you know, sense of, you know, gratification for ourselves and the effort that we're putting forth and the, you know, brain benefits of, possibly creating new brain cells and new protective proteins and the endorphins and the neurochemicals that, you know, boost our, our, our mood regulation and all of that. So there's so, you know, there's so many layers to it. It's so amazing. It's just like, it's just, it's just amazing to know about like the different layers of benefits that, (laughs) that accrue from something as simple as just spending time outside moving do you do you have any sense of like how much time we need to spend outside to start to gather some of these benefits or does it happen quickly is there is it like more is better or how often that is a fantastic question and i don't have a solid answer for that um but daily we need to to be in nature daily and if daily. we can't be in nature look at 
look at a pretty nature scape, listen mm-hmm. to some nature sounds, um, mm-hmm. as part of, you know, your, that's a great nighttime piece of, you know, if you do a nighttime routine, because it does help lower stress, reduce some of that tension, kind of get you ready for a sleep state. It induces that those alpha waves, which is, you know, helps calm you and get you ready for sleep. So, um, you know, I would, but if you can't do it daily, I would, three times a week for 20 to 30 minutes, but that's manageable. But I think that yeah, like most things, something is better than nothing. Right. Yeah. So whatever time you have do that. And, and, you know, Even we have, if it's just like getting up and looking out the window for a minute or two. It helps. Exactly. Just to be, be intentional and even just like yeah. go outside for, for a minute, feel the cold air on you, you know, mm-hmm. listen to the sounds and, or I say cold air, I'm looking at snow right now. So it's, it's currently it's cold. cold. That's why we're both like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, but, but again, just being intentional. So yeah, if you get up and just pay attention to look at, look at what's outside your window, what's there and yeah. spend five minutes, just really paying attention to that and being intentional about, about what your focus is on. It's really interesting too, to think that I think about how, like even looking at images or videos or, you know, listening to recorded nature sounds could be helpful. Cause I was, that was one thing I was going to ask you is like, what about when the weather is not conducive? Like we get a lot of rain here and it's there's snow right now and it's it may be not the best time to go out on a really long hike. <laughs> you know, what do you do? Uh, Cause we live pretty close to each other. Like when the weather's not really um, friendly for, I mean, I know some people are like, just bundle up and go. Yeah, and we I live will in do the that Northwest, to a point. So people love but... that, right? <laughs> Yeah, uh, I, I'll do it to a point, but there's, you know, I struggle with that because I do not like to be wet. I don't like to be cold. <laughs> and so getting outside this time of year is very much intentional for me. It's not something initially that I'm like, I really want to do this because I don't. Um, and so we have to look at like, what's our motivation? What's our goal? Right. When mm-hmm. I was, I was training for a half marathon last year around this time. And so I was running in the rain and whether it was cold and whatever, because I had the reason why I was doing it. I'm not doing that this year. So my time outdoors walking around has been much less, but, um, but that does bring me to the idea of seeking a little bit of stress and discomfort, right? Being in the rain or in the cold, it stimulates our system in a way that we normally don't because we're inside, we're warm, we're comfortable. Mm. And so it is a different, different type of interaction with the elements around us, our, our natural environment that we may not love in the moment, but it is, um, you know, depending on how we approach it, of course, but it can be, uh, help us to stimulate a little bit of stress and then and then practice our response to it Hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. because it is, it it is, you know, stressful in the body, the cold temperatures and things. So my advice for, for what to do when the weather is not, I mean, you, you just choose to go outside or you don't, I mean, really there's, (laughs) I don't have anything really great beyond that. Um, So I think that's where like the why comes in. Like, Mm -hmm. is it, is it cold? Is it uncomfortable? Yes, but it's is it, it is it beneficial for your brain and body? Yes. So yeah. I choose to do it some days. And some days I'm like, you know what, not today. <laughs> but yeah. um again, you know, it's so much come back comes back to the the intention piece. Like just making that choice. Mm-hmm. I like that. And I like the idea of using it as a stress resiliency practice to deliberately kind of expose yourself to that discomfort and then practice the recovery and maybe practice your calm breathing out in the rain yes, yeah. <laughs> or something like that, you know, to or make just it putting intentional. Your, yeah. And putting yourself in the space where it's like, I don't love this, but it is getting me the results that I want. Mm-hmm. And I mean, that application transfers throughout our life, right? Yes. I don't necessarily want to do this thing right now but I'm doing it because I know that it is going to get me the, 
the benefits that I'm looking for. Yeah. I love that. And then, um, you know, kind of on the, the positive experience side of things, you always talk about the pretty little things that you go out and find in nature, which seems like a very deliberate practice to, to be on the lookout yes. for beautiful things. <laughs> Can you tell us a little more about the practice of pretty little things? Yes. Um, I think I actually started doing that um, when, you know, early 2020, when we were all kind of locked down and not allowed to do anything for good reason. Um, and so I would go on, go on walks and I'm like, okay, you know, things are really, really stressful and whatever things suck right now. And then I would notice the flowers and just pay attention to how, how many little, pretty, pretty little things around me, um, I had to be grateful for. And that is, you know, something I just, I, I practice now because it forces that intentional focus on something positive. Mm -hmm. It forces the attention to go towards those things that I am grateful to have in this mm -hmm. moment, even if like, and you know, and that's why if I am feeling down, if I'm in a bad mood, I, you know, if I, if I can in that moment, I'm like, you know, I take the time to go for a walk, to get outside, to move outside, to move my body and to look for the pretty little things out there. Just those little tiny things around you. It doesn't have to be big. It just kind of reminds me that uh, you know, and ties into my gratitude practice and it doesn't have to be something huge or something complicated, or it doesn't have to be all of my dreams come true at once. You know, it's just <laughs> this tiny little thing that I can recognize and have some appreciation for. And what it's doing is again, yeah. Training my focus towards what is there that I can appreciate. What is there that, that, that makes me happy, gives me a smile, makes me laugh. And and that's, and starting that practice really has just throughout my days and not every day, some days, you know, you just, some days feel like you're stuck in mud and that's just what it is. Um, but the continued kind of attention that I pay to like, oh, that's a pretty little thing. That's really cool. And now that's, and now I see more of them. So yeah, you've yeah. trained yourself to see more of them and it's, I love it because I feel like it's it has to be very deliberate for me as well um, to look out for joyful things and practice gratitude and appreciation. But it's like, you know, when you think about the negativity bias, we're yes. like up against that, it's stacked against us. It's hard. It's harder to see these pretty little things. So we have to really like have a lot of repetition and, and really be on the lookout and really take it in and enjoy them. And that's so exactly that makes difference. what it is. I think you just explained it better than I did for sure. Um, <laughs> but, but that's exactly no. what it is. That's <laughs> because our brain does have an automatic, you know, bias to, to look for threat and look for danger. And it has this kind of negative, um, you know, propensity towards just like the negative. Mm -hmm. um, we do have to be intentional about seeking the positive, seeking the, the, little pieces in our days and, and train our focus in that way. Um, because otherwise it's, our brain will be like, Oh, what's that? That's danger. Oh, what's that? That could be danger. Oh. And then it makes a story about how it could be danger more. And, you know, and so I'm and, so good at that. <laughs> oh, I think <laughs> we all are. Yes. That is, uh, Oh my God. With these expanded frontal lobes, we've gained the capacity for imagination, <sighs> right? And the misuse of imagination. Uh -huh. <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it is just, it is that intention and in where do I want to place my focus? Because where we, we place our attention and focus, the things that we give our attention to, we're saying that this is important, right? This mm -hmm. is relevant information. Mm -hmm. You're telling your brain, look for more of this thing. And so again, what are we practicing? And as you do that over time, does that does that actually make literal changes in your brain? Um, I mean, there's no, I don't think there's, there, we don't have any studies on the pretty little thing. What, what's but, the pretty little thing yeah. um, section of the brain? Exactly. Right? 
but the pretty little thing cortex gets bigger. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> uh, but but you know there are studies on on gratitude and on mindfulness, like yeah. we talked about before, and how those do uh, those those practices do change the structure and function of the brain. They reduce the volume of you know the amygdala and kind of the limbic area, the, the kind of fear response system. Mm-hmm. Um, and increase more of the the frontal areas that deal in um, positive affect and reward and 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 those things. So, I mean, so I'm going to say yes. And again, any anybody who's listening to this that wants hard science evidence, you're not you're not. I can't. I don't have it for you. But um, that is that is kind of what I was getting at. Is because I think of it as it is like a um, like in the Buddhist tradition, we would call it mudita which is the gratitude and joy practice Mm -hmm. and it's a deliberate practice. And it, to me, like this falls under that. It's like being aware of the goodness around us exactly, in whatever form, like a flower or, you know, someone doing a good deed or, you know, whatever it might be. And that's exactly like, I I always train what a pretty little things to you or, going to be different than what I think are pretty little things. Mm -hmm. Um, Like I took a picture of, I don't know, it was like a moss or something. And somebody was like, oh, that's weird. Or something. I was like, I think it's beautiful, (laughs) you know? And so of course your pretty little things are going to be different than anyone else's. And that's, Mm -hmm. and they get to be whatever you, Mm -hmm. whatever brings you that joy and gratitude. Yeah. It could be someone's beautifully manicured fingernails uh, for some, which is clearly not, me but (laughs) you know (laughs) I can appreciate it in someone else but I don't do that myself very often but it could be but that's the thing you don't have like you can still appreciate it on someone else and that's still a pretty little thing yeah exactly there could be like I think we could just be be really open to including a lot of different you know possible stimulants of positivity if we train ourselves that way and I think that's that's what it does as well with my pretty little thing practice because, you know, throughout the year that changes. Like there's you know tons of green and flowers and um, other you know lots of vibrant colors and things here in the Northwest in the spring and summertime. In the winter, there isn't a lot of that, and so I have to be much more intentional and more flexible about what what are my parameters for for pretty little things. <laughs> It instead could be a of just being bird. like, yeah, well, and instead of, instead of just saying like, oh, there aren't any flowers, there yeah. isn't anything pretty, you know, and we do that so much in mm-hmm. our lives, like this thing doesn't exist. So there's nothing, everything sucks. Right. Right. Because our brain loves to generalize um, because it saves energy. And so expanding that perspective of like, okay, this thing may not be here, but what else can I find? that also is pretty. What else can I appreciate right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it could be like a beautiful bird or a beautiful snow crystal or a fall leaf or, you know, who knows what else. It could be like a beautiful vegetable on your plate. (laughs) Yes, yes. Or just, or just, and kind of shifting shifting the perspective like i'm looking at these the branches on this tree outside my window and they're they're bare and i prefer i don't know if i prefer but you know i I think if i think about oh beauty i think about leaves and vibrance and color and stuff but you know i i look up at the bare branches against the blue sky and there is something really beautiful about that oh yeah so again taking and i think it's just you have to be intentional. You have to take the moment to pause, to consider these things. And when you are, you're not spending the time worrying about all of the other things that you have on your plate, right? The, the what yeah. ifs and the to-do lists and all of the things you're in this moment looking at, is, is this pretty to me? What is this? This looks different. And, and, you know, so you're spending that again, intentional, uh, you know, time and focus energy directed outward rather than at the chaos that that can exist in our heads that the echo chamber mm-hmm. in the brain yeah yeah 
That's so helpful. And that's one thing actually that uh, studies have found is that being in nature and the way that our attention is in nature uh, interacts with something called the default mode network. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what um, is active when we're not really focused on something, when we're daydreaming or just kind of thinking about um, ourselves a lot, the stories that we like to tell about ourselves, about, you know, past or future. Um, That is uh, the default network. And that part of the brain, that that network of systems likes to tell stories and a lot of the time it's ruminating mm-hmm. if we just they're kinda... usually not like happy tales no um, right? <laughs> no <laughs> um, and so uh so these studies have found that 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 changes the interaction with that network in that time oh. in, in nature um because again your your focus is not internal and you are externally oriented in a place that is stimulating in a, in a, in a calming way. And so that makes sense to me. But, um, so that's why those stories and that narrative, their kind of ongoing dialogue about, especially if you have a, you know, strong inner critic and, and tend to be hard on yourself. It's kind of a pause button on that mm. when you're out in nature. Wow. That's so helpful. I love that. So, um, where can people find out more about your work and keep learning from you and connect with you? Um, I am on Instagram mostly. That's a good social, social space to find me. And I, I always have to think, I'm like, what is it? Um, it's at JPB dot brain body resilience. And um, from there, I have a link to my website and my resources, my mailing list, uh, my podcast, um, all of those things. So you can find that there. If you don't have social media, um, my website is the same. It's www.brainbodyresilience.com. Um, and you can find all the things there as well. And your podcast is called Brain Body Resilience? Brain Body Resilience, yeah. Yeah, which is excellent and a, a great listen. Thank so. you. Okay. Thank you so much for taking the time for this conversation about a topic that I deeply love, you know, being outside and, and, you know, all these uh, wonderful physical, mental, meditative benefits of nature. It's so fun to pick your brain about this. I'm, I love having these conversations. And, and again, I love just kind of I love the science behind it, but when, when the available literature is limited, I also appreciate having to rely on my own sense of, you know, my, my internal knowing, I know that I feel good in nature and I know, and I love being able to make sense of it through a scientific, scientific perspective. And I guess I, I want to leave, leave the people with that is, trust your feelings, trust, trust how you feel, trust when you feel calm. Mm. Um, Notice that. Notice that and then do more of that. Such good advice. Thank you for leaving us with that. Yes. Thank you so much for having me back. I'm so excited to be your first repeat here. (laughs) My pleasure. It was such a joy to talk about this. So that's today's episode. If you enjoyed this conversation, please share it with a friend and or leave us a review on Apple Podcasts and help others find us that way. To learn more about my work, the Moved to Meditate class library, live online classes, teacher trainings, and private lessons, go to movedtomeditate.yoga. Thanks so much for listening.